I'm joined today by Harvey Kay, who is professor of democracy and justice studies at the University of Wisconsin, Green Bay, also author of the book, The Fight for the Four Freedoms, What Made FDR and the Greatest Generation Truly Great. And our topic today is the rise of right wing anti intellectualism as a kind of historical context, uh, Harvey. Where do you where do you see this dating back to? When did we first start to see this? Well, I think throughout American history, we've seen examples of conservative forces, whether they be on the, on among the Republicans or the Democrats, uh, a certain hostility to intellectualism. Uh, in part, that it goes all the way back to the idea that intellectuals are the folks who who came over from uh, from Europe and brought their dangerous ideas with them. You know, whether they were uh, Jacobins of the French, you know, friends of the French Revolution, or later uh, abolitionists of a sort, or even later socialists and anarchists. So there is that fear of of ideas as somehow alien to America, uh, which fails to appreciate the degree to which America's greatest political figures, from uh, Jefferson and Thomas Paine, uh, all the way through to the likes of Martin Luther King have all been in their fashion intellectuals and even our greatest presidents uh, most especially the, the likes of Abraham Lincoln have given us words and ideas that that clearly rank among the greatest intellectual ideas of their day but but in any case I, I think if we if we talk about the contemporary uh, we have to see the degree to which the building in the in the wake of McCarthyism and all that, the building, especially in the 1970s, of the new conservative movement, which relied so much on two major foundations: one, the corporate world, and on the other, the the world of Christian fundamentalism and evangelicalism. That these provided a, a certain kind of antagonism to ideas and indeed intellectuals. When um, when the Trilateral Commission, which was by no means specifically Republican, but but rather a, an, an elite organization of business and related folk uh, gathered in the early 1970s, worried about the fact that the United States was becoming too democratic, that we were suffering a crisis of democracy, an excess of democracy. Uh, they included uh, on their list of antagonists not only uh, a, a you know, not only the media and but also universities, the fear of ideas emanating from 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 academe that somehow threatened their power, their authority, their capacity to decide how they wanted to pursue their profits, the believing that uh, intellectuals were going to impose regulations and controls on them regarding the environment, workplace practices, and so on, which indeed they were doing. Well, it, seems, on the like, other hand, it, seems, it seems like today, not to interrupt, but I, there was a lot there, and I kind of want to you know look into some oh, of those sure. things more specifically. It seems like today this issue of the threat to conservative ideals is a, is an important piece through which the anti intellectual movement is being informed. I mean, we saw a, a number of Republican candidates, including people like Rick Santorum, talk very negatively about the concepts of higher education and we're never going to have the smart, educated people on our side, kind of as an ad hominem that ended up be, becoming kind of a funny joke. But we're seeing that the threat the sense of of higher education as a threat to conservative ideals become very forefront today. Well, I can tell you that that you, you struck a decidedly personal note for me right now. I, I'm a professor at the university was in the University of Wisconsin system, and not only are we about to suffer a three hundred million dollar budget cut, and may may well lose uh, members of the faculty in the in the course of those cuts. When Scott Walker proposed the cuts, he also proposed the idea of a public authority for higher education. That right. is, that it, it, he presented it as if this was going to liberate the university from direct state control. But the most telling thing in his effort to rewrite the relationship between the state and public higher, higher education is that he wanted to remove, I mean, he, he had already edited out, excised out, you know, crossed out the line in education in the state, the commitment, as we call it, the Wisconsin idea to one, the pursuit of truth, and then the pursuit of public service, which is to say academics, intellectuals would not only sort of talk to each other, but would take their learning and their ideas and project it to the borders of the state. I mean, can you imagine trying to 
excise from higher education's purpose the pursuit of truth? That, that tells you a great deal, doesn't it, about the politics of conservative Republicans? It certainly does. And, and I think that w there's kind of two sides to this. There's, of course, the kind of propagandist side, which is the attacks, attacks and the negative comments around the ideas of thinking and, and higher education and a search for truth. And then we can look at kind of the pragmatic steps that the anti intellectual right is taking. I think defunding education is certainly a huge one. We've seen the rewriting of textbooks in Texas and in other parts of the United oh, States. What right. else is being done pragmatically to try to push back against what seems to be uh, or or, or the, this kind of and I, and I hesitate to even call it an intellectual movement. It's just that there's an anti movement. Well, it's an interesting uh, point. And one of the things that I've sort of found myself doing is saying, have I been around so long that everything old is new again? Um, if you if you look at the literature that's come out on on from the right, um, built into it is a decided uh, a persistent attack on intellectuals, a persistent attack on dissident ideas. Um, but the way I reviewed a, a book for the Daily Beast titled "The Shame." Um, Shame by the renowned black conservative intellectual, or people like to combine the terms conservative and intellectual, by the black conservative writer, Shelby Steele, who's at the renowned conservative think tank, the Hoover Institution. And, and it's a, a, a straight out assault on, not simply on liberal politics, but a straight out assault on liberal ideas. Uh, and basically that those, that liberal ideas for these last 40 and 50 years have promoted a kind of politics and ideology that has led minorities and most especially African Americans to suffer and basically to become dependents of the state and indeed the liberal elite. I mean, if you look at the writings of conservatives these days, the, the arguments that we, we associated with Rush Limbo over these many decades are now becoming, if you like, you know, sort of uh, the, the words and ideas even of folks who posture as themselves intellectual. Uh, when I read Shelby Steele's work, I kept thinking, haven't I heard this before? Haven't I read this before? Perhaps in a cruder fashion from Rush Limbaugh, Glenn, Be Glenn Beck, and others. Um, so I, I, I think there's that. I think as well we have to consider the degree to which, if you look at um, the so-called mainstream media, the absence of liberal left voices and the inclusion in the media conversation of folks who, who, uh, who appear to be liberal because they have you know, more of a mind than others, perhaps and they've given more attention to ideas, but often they're as centrist as centrist can be. There is, as I said, this exclusion from any kind of, it used to be the case they would say, well, look, Noam Chomsky and Howard Zinn are excluded from, from mainstream public debates. I mean, the, the, the degree to which the left broadly is excluded nowadays. Don't you think that there, there could be another strategy for the anti-intellectual right, which is to try to intellectualize their positions. And we've seen this happen in, in, in kind of small instances, sometimes around uh, you'll, you'll have Christian apologists who present their right wing oh. ideas <laughs> as as kind of pseudo intellectual. We see it in little right. instances, sometimes with taxation and, and supply side economics. But broadly speaking, it hasn't been done that much. Well, I think what we I, one element that I'd like to to remind us all of is this. Ever since Ronald Reagan uh, in, uh, began his, his, main, his, his, his move himself towards something of the center, at least his rise to the presidency in the 1970s, what we've seen is this concerted effort on the part of conservatives to lay claim to American history from the American Revolution all the way through. And that is, and, and in laying claim to American history, to lay claim to the ideal, to, to patriotism, indeed, to ideas that were very fundamental to liberal, progressive, and radical thought for 200 years, uh, going back to Thomas Paine. And that is that America was, that America was perhaps indeed exceptional, not exceptional in the sense of superior to us, but projected as an, an exceptional set of ideas having to do with freedom, equality, and democracy. And our task was to try to live up to those ideas and to advance them. And now, Nowadays, um, what we've seen is that conservatives who for 200 years 
did everything in their power to suppress the memory of the likes of Thomas Paine, have appropriated such folks, completely removed any of the, the sort of progressive radical elements of the ideas, you know, pulled out of context their words and used them as if they're the ones who represent American history, that they're the ones who represent American patriotism. Indeed, as if they're the ones who can tell us what makes America exceptional, and somehow it always seems to, re to, to refer to a kind of superiority. No, I mean, it's an across-the-board campaign on everything from history to political economy in which the ideas of, you know, again, liberals, progressives, and radicals are marginalized. You know, we saw it in, in its worst form, of course, during the McCarthy period. Period. But we see it today in a sense that uh, we're driven from, from the public square. In fact, it's funny, but what is it, about 10, 15, 20 years ago, they talk about religion being driven from the public square. Now it seems that anyone with serious ideas is being driven from the public square if, it, if they're not speaking a conservative uh, rhetoric. Very, very interesting and important topic. We've been speaking with Harvey K., professor of democracy and justice studies at the University of Wisconsin, Green Bay. Thanks so much for being on. Thank you, David. Thank you very much.